All right, guys, how we doing? Uh, welcome to this special, almost like emergency press conference episode of For Checking TV. As always, I'm your host, Doug Lackey. Alongside me is my co-host, Scotty Porterfield. And today I decided to bring on Locked On Penguins' own Hunter Hodes. Hunter, how we doing, buddy? Not bad. You know, been a crazy day already, and I'm sure tomorrow is going to be even crazier with all the signings that are coming. Yeah, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm very, very upset that I have to work tomorrow. Uh, it's going to be an interesting day. Um, I was I was texting Smitty from around the 412 earlier th- th- this morning. I said to him that, uh, you know, I never thought that we'd get another like hall for Larson type news day. And we've had three of those in the past seven days. So, I mean, it's, it's cause I was at the beach that day with my girlfriend and I just like every five minutes, just a trade or something kept coming through. I was like, this is like 2016 level stuff with Stamkos, the hall trade. And then you had the Weber for Subban thing. It was like, wow, like, I don't know where this came from, but today has been one thing after another too. Yeah, I mean, and it's not even just trades. There's a lot of signings going on, you know. Um, but we're going to basically just kick this thing off by talking about Marc-Andre Fleury. Um, in case any of you have missed it, Marc-Andre Fleury got traded to the Chicago Blackhawks today for a – probably like a AHL – like an AHL-level forward. Um, and – Vegas took on his full cap hit, and it's currently looking like Flurry and his agent, Alan Walsh, are leaning towards not reporting to Chicago. And either another trade is in the works or retirement is on the horizon. If this is the end of uh, Mark andre Flurry's road, what a weird career. You know what I mean? Like, imagine being the first overall pick you know, you're the, you're the, like the hope of the franchise. They're putting their faith in you. You become this cup winning hero. You make the diving save across the crease on a hall of fame defenseman. And then you just become a meme for a couple of years. You know, you be, you basically become the, the reason why your team doesn't win another Stanley cup. You almost get run out of town. And then you sort of redeem yourself in 28 in 2017, excuse me, helping the penguins push for that, uh, their fifth Stanley cup in franchise history, the third in the, uh, in the flurry air, if you want to call it that, you know, he becomes the face of Vegas. Once he gets taken the expansion draft becomes a meme again, gets stabbed in the back by Pierre DeBoer. At least that's how his agent thinks of it. Probably wins the Vesna trophy at age 36 and then gets stabbed in the back by Vegas. I mean, what a weird career just to think about it. And honestly, the perfect way to cap it off would just be telling Chicago to bite it and just retire instead. I thought it to be the perfect way to cap off such a weird career. A Hall of Fame one, though. He should just tell them that with everything that organization is going through right now, especially off the ice, that I don't want to play there due to that, and then just dip, either retire or just, you know, force his way back. You know, I'll probably sound like a hypocrite. I, I don't really care. You know, I've long dumped on all the Yinzers who, you know, bagged for Flurry back, like how um, – a guy or a girl, you know, uh, just asks for their desperate ex to come back into their life because that is basically what this is. You're just being desperate and begging your ex to come back. Um, but at this point, you know, if Chicago wants to eat, eat half his salary at 3.5 million for next year, who cares? I mean, it's one year. I don't know if they'll extend him after that anyway. Maybe he can retire off into the sunset. You know, Malkin and Latang's contracts are also up. Next year, I'm sure those take high, more, I think, a higher priority than Marc Andre Fleury. But if they want to do it and they want to bring him back and they want him to be the starter for at least a year, he can do it. And then, he, like I said, he can retire, go off into the sunset. He'll be 37, I think, at that point anyway. He has nothing left to prove. I think that's my biggest thing. So if he wants to come back, do one last year here, I'm fine with it. Again, I'm probably going to be called a hypocrite by a lot of people, especially on the show that I do later today. But, you know, I don't really give a damn. Um, I think it makes a lot more sense right now than it did when he was still with Vegas. And you can honestly probably tempt Chicago to take a contract in return because Stan Bowman is not that smart. Yeah. um, I mean, you guys know this. I was the biggest flurry hater for (laughs) 
a good, better part of four years. Um, but I have fully turned into the Joker. And by saying I've turned into the Joker, I mean the old habits are dying hard. I'm turning, I've turned back into a Yinzer. I'm foaming at the mouth and I need Mark Andre Fleury back in Pittsburgh. You know, um, speaking of Sam Bowman taking back back contracts, um, with the recent acquisition of Seth Jones, it is noted that he has a track record of being um, intrigued by painfully average overpaid defensemen. Mike Matheson, come on down. Somehow find a way to make that happen. That would be hilarious. I know it's not realistic, but um, I think probably doing like just a re salary retention type trade with Flurry, or maybe even getting a third team involved might help the Penguins and make it more realistic for Pittsburgh. Don't you should we share the uh, the trade that you sent me the the, the one that you sent me about uh, throwing in Arizona? Do you want to do you want to mention that to the masses, or should we just keep that? You know, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna roll that out in a second. But Hunter, what did you want to say? It, it would work. You know, I don't know who's gonna touch Mike Matheson's contract because he signed until we're all basically 90 years old at this point. Um, it, all it takes is one GM. All, a lot of GMs like to take on bad contracts. We call it the old old boys club for a reason. You know, Arizona took on Shane Gossesbury's contract, and he's kind of washed at this point. Um, they also took on Andrew Ladd's deal. I don't even know if that guy's ever going to play again. If he does, he probably, he's probably going to play like 10 games on the fourth line or something. Yeah, Anton but, Stroman. I mean, it, it makes sense. I think Pedersen's probably more likely to be moved than Matheson. It sounds like they yeah. like Matheson from what I was told by, you know, a couple people, uh, especially Josh Yowie on my show. Um, I guess it makes sense because he had a decent season, but, you know, at five more years, I don't really think you know, he's probably not going to finish his contract here. No, but, you know, I can understand Pittsburgh being um, very into how good he is at carrying the puck into the offensive zone because that's something that they really haven't had, at least to the level of Matheson, with the exception of Chris Letang in quite some time. Um, you know, there's time – like, I've never seen a defenseman that the Penguins have had outside of Letang maybe when he was younger or more in his prime they could just carry the puck in for a really good scoring chance like Mike Matheson can. Yeah. You know, but yeah. But I, mean, I just, I mean, I'm all, I'm all in on it. They want to bring him back. You know, he's probably a better option than a Marizic or a Linus Olmark. I can take John Gibson over him, but you're probably going to have to part with the farm for him. Uh, Darcy Kemper. sounds like that's going to be a bidding war. Yeah. Um, don't really think they're going to have the assets to give up what they want. And it sounds like they might, they may be out considering I saw Pierre LeBrun's earlier tweet, you know, Flory Lund knows the city. He knows the fans. I'm sure this is probably the only team he'd come back for. And again, it's only for a year. Who knows what happens after this year when his contract is up, if he wants to come back, okay, you know, one year deal, cheaper cap hit. Um, they can move out salary any way they want with a couple other players. They also, though they do have Brian Russ to pay next year. If they want to sign him back. Kapanen's up. The big, obviously, two, uh, the other big two players are up as well. Um, but I think right now, when you look at all, all the goalie options, you know, you know all the highs and lows with him. He just won the Vesna. I, I think he honestly would be better than a lot of these other options. And yeah, you know, it, it'd be funny to see all the reactions if he comes back. That's for sure. It's just going to be a, you know, like I said, it, it's like, you know, your, your ex that you're still in love with coming back to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know, man. It's, it's crazy. I have a three team trade idea in my head. Um, Arizona would receive draft picks um, for it would be so Chicago would retain 50% of Flurry's contract, send him to Arizona for draft picks. Then we would trade, then like one of the, some, somebody would trade like a pick or a prospect to Arizona, and Casey DeSmith would end up in Chicago, and the Penguins would get Flurry at $1.75 million against the cap. Would be, um, that'd be some shrewd cap maneuvering if you're only getting him for less than $2 million. And you'll still have space to sign another hometown boy, Brandon Saad, who's also hitting the market tomorrow. So um, 
and in case anyone didn't read that article, he's um, he's interested in coming back. So um, that would yeah that would uh, that three way trade would make a lot of sense. I think you know they tried I think to do that something like similar last year when Rutherford was still here. I think the rumor trade was supposed to be a three way deal, so that it, it I think two teams would eat some cap before he would come to Pittsburgh. Um, mm-hmm. Don't see why not. It wouldn't make sense now. Um, at the least, though, I'm sure Chicago would gladly retain half of it to go down to three and a half. But if you can get another team in there, as Doug said, to get it down below two, you know, kind of like close to what Jeff Carter they did with Carter because he's only making what two point six for this season. Yeah, that would make all the sense in the world. Yeah, like get it get it down as low as you can because I think the idea of having Flurry and Tristan Jari coexist together here would be the best case scenario because you know we've talked about it back and forth scotty and i for quite some time pretty much the entire summer since the islander series and it's probably not wise for them to give up on tristan jari this soon um that dynamic will be weird though like him there with jari uh, that's awkward that's mm-hmm. really awkward I don't think anything could get more awkward than the last year of Flurry and Murray, though. Yeah, that's that's true. That that's definitely awkward, especially with the mask that he had, thanking all of his teammates on the back, and you know Murray coming in for him. I, I still will say though, I think this would be really awkward for all parties, especially Jari. Like, wow, the franchise icon is coming in to basically take my job after I know I was bad, but it, it's still. Hopefully, he can still play well, even though. Flurry would come in, I think, and easily take his job, and rightfully so. Yeah, you know, and what I'm hoping for is like another Flurry Murray dynamic where they just play off of each other so well. Because the thing that made Murray and Flurry work was the things that Flurry was bad at, Murray was really good at, and vice versa. And that was really, I think, the driving force behind the Penguins getting those back to back cups was how unique of a goaltending dynamic they had with those two. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I think, I mean, I think they should just bring them back. You know, I keep talking about this idea of them having like a last dance. Just basically, set it up. Basically will be with those big four, you know, the, the after next season, I don't think all big, all those big four are going to be there. I think three of them will. Um, obviously the franchise defensemen, the two franchise forwards, but um, with how old, uh, with how much older Flurry will be next year, I don't think they're going to try to sign him. I think he'll go, I don't think he'll go somewhere else. I think he'll retire after that season, to be honest. Yeah. You know, especially if they have a deep playoff run or something out of the ordinary compared to what we're expecting, you know, and that's the thing that's going to be difficult is like, that age gap between Flurry and Crosby and Malkin is going to kick in and we're going to realize like, okay, like this is going to be a one and done thing. If he does come in. It's not, honestly not that big of an age gap though. You got to remember like Flurry was drafted in 03. Malkin was mm-hmm. in 04 and Crosby and Latang was in 05. So, I mean, we're, if, it's not that big of a gap if we're being real with, with each other here, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's just not, you know, the difference isn't that big, I'd say, at least for yeah. my yeah, no, I don't disagree, um, but I don't know. I think you just bring them in under the assumption that this is going to be a one-and-done type scenario, um, you know, so, because so – Rodgers with the Packers, one last dance, and then he's gone. Well, different because the parameters are different with that because he actually wants mm-hmm. – it. it's basically, you know, one last dance. You know, they'll somehow win the cup, and he'll he'll easily ride off into the sunset there. <laughs> That'll be four for him, so – uh, imagine if Jordan Stahl's game falls off a cliff and they trade for him at the deadline. That'd be kind of funny, but I don't, I don't foresee him ever leaving. Carolina. It's impossible. Jeff, Jeff Carter, Jeff Carter is the Jordan Stahl counterpart in this scenario, in my opinion. So I don't know. Um, all right. That's enough flurry talk for me for right now. I'm like almost giddy about this. We need to start actually talking about actual free agency stuff. Um, Lots of really good players did not receive qualifying offers yesterday. Um, you know, you had Andre Kasha, Nick Ritchie from Boston, both hitting the unrestricted free agency. Analytical darling, Pius Suter, 
not being tendered a contract by Chicago. And now they have absolutely zero cap space to re-sign them. So uh, that that's somebody that I'm zeroing in on if I'm Pittsburgh. Um, just if you look at his uh, analytics and his player card from Jay Fresh, um, you can see that um, you could have the assumption that he could single-handedly replace the production that Jared McCann brought in a uh, reduced top nine role. Pius Suter, that is. I think, you know, he did have 14 goals in his rookie season. Mm-hmm. I'd be a little wary just because it's a very small sample. He's still only 24. He can potentially fall off. But I think almost every team should be in on that guy. How he was not yeah. falling, I just goes to show the Blackhawks have no idea what they're doing. Um, not even off the ice, but on the ice um, as well. That is just a dumpster fire of an organization right now. And if I were Pittsburgh, yeah, I mean, I would sign him in a heartbeat to a, like a two-year deal. I don't know how much he's going to get. I don't know what evolving hockey has for him on his projected deal. It's probably only close to a couple million. There's your, I guess, expected TANEV replacement. If they want to think higher um, for a top nine role, um, just go out and get Brandon Saad or Tomas Tatar. I, I think Tatar is a better version than him. I think he's also going to take a cheaper deal than what some people think. But if you can land one of those two, one of those three players, um, you know, your off season's off to a really good start, even though um, losing McCann kind of for nothing still stings a little bit. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, and I think the big thing that's missing in all of this is as it stands right now, they still have Jason Zucker um, who, who knows what type of role he's in next year. Um, you know, if they are able to make a signing or two at forward and create a good depth lineup, even with Malkin out, one could say that Jason Zucker might be a third line forward on this roster. And that's something that I really like from a matchup perspective. And it might help them get him going and help, you know, maybe put the puck in the back of the net like a lot of people expected him to whenever he was first traded here from Minnesota. Yeah, the, um, it'd be nice if they can get the, the Zucker that they had back in 2020 um, than this year because he was averaging close to a point per game from the regular season mm-hmm. to the playoffs. I think he was one of their best players in that bubble against Montreal. And I know most of the team didn't play well there, but um, he was playing great either with, either on Sidney Crosby or Vinny Malkin's wing. Um, I, I know a lot of people are quick to trade him, and, and don't get me wrong, I would love the salary cap space. But I'm, all, I'm also kind of indifferent on it that if they keep him, I think he can get back to the level that we saw. But if they do decide to deal him and upgrade, whether it's Tatar or Saad or Suter or whoever else in free agency, I also wouldn't be mad either. But, you know, I guess in some way I'm trying to say is they need a left winger because they've lost two already, especially with McCann. You know, Ron Hextall can say all he wants with, you know, we, we think we can fill these roles internally. No, you can't. You can't. There, there's no one in the organization that's probably going to come up and do what McCann did. You, know, you can say you think they can and Poulin and McGarry and Hollander. Chances are the, all three of those players probably won't be ready this year. So you're going to have to go outside the organization to do something. Yeah, exactly. And I had this conversation today with my dad and he said the same thing to me. And I said to him, like, the only player – in their system that's remotely like of any type of value that I think could be ready to go this year might be Valtteri Pustin and if he's able to have a good start in the AHL coming over to North to, coming over to North American ice. Um, you know, Hollander could be an option just out of necessity, but you know, I don't even think about Polan or Legere as guys that can come up and you know, do things well enough to be productive players at the NHL level right now. You know, I think they need a year in Wilkes-Barre, maybe more. I'd say so. I agree with that. I feel like right now, you know, the Penguins are, in terms of their prospect pool, are in the, like, bottom five of the league, I'd say. So it's not like you're looking at this saying, okay, we're just, you know, we're waiting for this one guy to, you know, develop a little bit more and then he's good to go. I don't think you really have a guy on that in your, in your prospect pool right now that is, you know, somewhat ready for the NHL at all. So 
best thing to do is try and look for your options outside because they're definitely not down on the farm right now or down in juniors at all. Yeah, you know, that's, that's, that's the price you pay with winning. I mean, you're, you're going to have a uh, – excuse my language. You're, you're going to have a shitty prospect pool when you've won three Stanley Cups since 09. Um, hopefully they'll be able to build it back up for as long as Hextall is here. You know, he's always kind of seen as a builder. But, yeah, I mean, again, you know, I'll just say this. The, the, the thing that they can fill these roles internally, they're just looking at it wrong. And I'm sure that's just bluffing too, by the way. Yeah, you know, and I think it's all about trying to prop up some of the guys within the organization because, you know, the big thing that we don't have with Jim Rutherford is we have no idea what's coming. We have no idea what's about to happen. You know, Ron Hextall isn't using the media's lip service to, you know, send out warning shots or wrestle some jimmies or shake up the room or whatever the hell it is. You know, Ron Hextall actually knows what he's doing. And he's kept Brian Burke at bay so much to a point that um, that narrative of this being Berkey's team is pretty much dead, which is fantastic. Um, I just jinxed it. They're going to trade for Nick Delorier tomorrow. Or, or Milan Lucic from the article today. You know, to be fair, you know, I was talking with Jason, the guy who has the Penn State cat um, picture. Yeah. I was talking, yeah. With, talking with him, you know, we were discussing, you know, just – you know, trade for Milan Lucic, they can eat half his cap and then we can just dump Mike Matheson's contract over there and then they can put him on the fourth line. Not the worst thing in the world, but, you know, in a perfect world, I would not want to trade for Milan Lucic, that's for sure. I mean, it wouldn't be horrible, though. Like, it would, he'd, he'd fit with Aston Reese and Bluger. He's in the 80th percentile in even strength defense, <clears> which <throat> I looked at that, saw that was unbelievable. I'm sure those two can carry Milan Lucic on the fourth line, even though he's making $3 million. I, I'm sure they could keep him at bay, <laughs> is my opinion. I mean, they carried Brandon Tanev. Yeah, <laughs> basically. Hey, Tanev actually had decent offense this year for, like, the first time in a while, but – I mean, we all know Ashton Reese is the glue on that line anyway. He can basically carry anyone on the fourth line. Yeah. I'm sure. yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's why I'm thinking they fill that fourth line role internally. And mm-hmm. when I say in- filling it internally, I'm afraid we're going to get Sam Lafferty shoved down our throats. Not, uh, no, I think Freddie Goudreau over him. I think they'll sign him back. I think, you know, my, my only issue is, is if, if Carter has to play up in the lineup, Freddie might be the third line center to start the year. God help me. Yeah. The hard pass. Um, I don't know who else. I I mean, Bluger is the other center, but uh, yeah, I think you would kind of be right. Hopefully they don't have to play Sam Lafferty um, a lot. That's for sure. This is also why I'm a huge proprietor for Pius Suter because he can play center. Um, He was their number. He was Chicago's number one center for half the year and he held his head above water. He played really good with Patrick Kane start the year and it was a really good stop gap until Kirby Doc got healthy. So that's something that I'd be looking at. Um, you know, now let's talk about the defenseman. Um, what are you, Hunter, what are your thoughts as to why might um, Marcus Pedersen hasn't been moved yet? Do you think that he's not on the market at this rate? Because, you know, we see some of the defensemen getting moved and what they're getting moved for. And you're starting to get to a point where you're like, okay, Marcus Pedersen might be worth way more than what we think he could be actually worth. Yeah, I think they're just trying to staple him with a hockey deal. I'm sure if they wanted to dump him for futures, they probably would have done it already. I mean, mm-hmm. Brendan Dillon just got traded for two second round picks, and I think he's going to wash at this point, to be honest. Yeah. Um, Pedersen is a better defenseman if you look at the underlying numbers uh, there with him. Again. I'm sure they could get a future second round pick for him. I think they're just trying to include him in a hockey deal, you know, to get like another need. I think Rossi and them were speculating about it. You know, he would might be, he could have been in a package to get Darcy Kemper from Arizona. Um, that kind of helps them cap wise. I think they maybe were trying to uh, package Zucker with him. Jari. I think that's probably what they're going for. Maybe if that doesn't work, they could still dump him for a future that creates more cap space, but um, again, it, it, it's got to be that or they just don't want to trade him that much. But again, everything that we've been reading uh, leads me to believe that he is available. It's just I don't know if they want to give him away for futures. Yeah, I agree. You know, my thing is, is like they could replace him, I think, on the free agent market for 
a cheaper cap hit than what he currently makes. But the issue is, is they need to find somebody they know they can mesh with John Marino. Um, and a lot of people give Pedersen a lot of flack, but there is one thing that's for certain. He keeps – he's a lot of what helps John Marino along and keeps him at bay and makes him work, you know. So, like, in my opinion, if you got to pay Marcus Pedersen $4 million a year for the rest of that contract to keep John Marino very productive, um, I say you do it. Like that's fine with me. You know, I, he, he did play his best hockey next to Pedersen. That Matheson Marino pairing never works because both of those players want the puck, especially Matheson. And then you're just leaving Marino to really just play defensively in his own zone when he also is great at moving the puck up the ice. He's a good playmaker. He's good in the offensive zone and can keep the puck there. And it's just, you know, he needs a steady defensive presence with him uh, to keep him at bay a little bit. Yeah, and that's why I'm not completely sold on the idea of like moving Pedersen out and throwing POJ with Marino because it's it would be the same principle that um, he went through early in the year earlier in the year with Mike Matheson on his uh, left side. You know, both two guys that like to take the puck off the ice like to take chances, and they're going to be stuck trying to figure out which one's going to cover. And I think that could set up for a lot of potential disaster scenarios similar to what we saw whenever POJ had to play with Latang. You know, um, but really, you know, there's a lot of big stuff going on. Um, I just had a notification come across that uh, the Avs are currently lowballing Gabriel Landeskog. I saw that on Twitter. That's kind of embarrassing that they're only offering 6.3. I guess they're trying to go what Boston did to David Posternak, except he bid on it. But Landerskog has also been there longer. He's been the face of that team, even when they were really bad. So I, I think he's probably going to be a little insulted by that offer. I don't, he's, that's going to be interesting. I wonder if it's going to be like the Petrangelo situation where there was a lot of emotion that was involved with those negotiations and then he just dipped. And I'll be curious to see if Landeskog does the same thing. I, I think they might find a way, um, but definitely, it's definitely one to watch. That's for sure. Well, it's funny. Yeah, and I think. Go ahead, Scotty. So it's funny you mentioned Petrangelo because I think that could be a potential place that he lands in is uh, St. Louis. I think that could be a place for Landis to fit in there. Honestly. Yeah. They they have a need for another big time center there. Yeah, especially if Tarasenko's gone, so you'd have the room to sign him. And you already lost Vince Dunn too, so you know definitely could be a landing spot for him in a tomorrow tomorrow afternoon. So we'll have to wait and see, but I'd be keeping an eye on him that. As long as it's not the Islanders, then I don't care. No, the Islanders are going to get Parise. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think he'll probably go back to Lula Morello. Though I did see in that Rossi article this morning that there two people told him that he may sign with Pittsburgh. I don't really know where that interest came from. I've not seen that reported anywhere else. Um, I, I think, Doug, I think Aston Reese could easily carry Parise on the fourth line too. <laughs> That'd be pretty yeah, easy. definitely. But my big thing is, is like, if you're going to sign Zach Parise, I'd be afraid that it's for more than like a third line role. You know what yeah. I mean? And I don't think he like, can play top six minutes anymore. <laughs> no, I don't even think he could play third line minutes at this point. Um, he's really just a body at this rate. Um, you know, but uh, yeah, just like Scotty said, I was just about to say that um, St. Louis would be nice for Landeskog for several reasons. Um, one, it would reunite him with Ryan O'Reilly. Um, we all know that they go way back, back to the Colorado days when whenever O'Reilly was there. And it would take the Blues out of the running for Brandon Saad. Um, out of all the teams that were listed to be connected to Brandon Saad, I think the only team that the Penguins are really in, like competing with is St. Louis. So if they're able to sweep in and get Landeskog, St. Louis, that is, I feel like it basically just makes it all but a done deal for uh, Brandon Saad to come home and be the Pittsburgh kid. Has him at four times 4.9 for their projection. If they can shave that down to 4.1, 4.2, I'd be more inclined to do it. I'll, Jeff from the Pens blog was tweeting yesterday, you know, say the team is not that good in three years. He has one more mm -hmm. year left. 
you can just dump him and a team would take him. A two-time cup winner, has all the intangibles that you want, toughness and all that, all good, still a good score. You could get a really good haul, I think, for him. But I think with how the organization probably is still, I guess, a little miffed that what it sounds like that they didn't get him in 2016, um, even though it really didn't matter because they got a better player in Phil Kessel. I don't know why people are so mad about that. But um, a chance to sign a hometown kid who still has family here. and He's still putting up good numbers. Um, and it's at a position to need. Um, I think they'd be doing a disservice if they weren't in the running for him or trying to get him. Another place uh, that I thought about uh, for Saad potentially, because let's just assume that, you know, he's willing to look past the fact that he's living in his hometown again, and he actually just wants to go get paid somewhere. There's a team, uh, a brand new team that's got a lot of uh, cap room to play with here. So, I mean, a team that could definitely pull down a Brandon Saad and add a, and potentially him being a top six forward too would be the Seattle Kraken. They have like 30 million in cap space. Um, I, they were a team I was looking at for Eichel, though I think that's going to be Vegas now. That, that screams Vegas all over it. I think Kelly McCrimmon just said, you know, to all you outside people, we need a centered, but, you know, uh, internally, we don't really feel, haven't felt the same, which of course is just probably bluff talk. I mean, whatever, he can say that, but then he's like, it's interesting. So he's probably mostly bluffing. I'm sure they're in on it. They have the, they have the package that they can do it. I'm sure they could give up Peyton Krebs if they wanted to a first round pick Alex Tuck, um, a couple others. I'm sure to get it done. Um, that just, that screams like what's going to happen there, but yeah, that's a good point with Seattle. They should be honestly um, busy. I would say tomorrow they, they can go after a lot of players. I think Jaden Schwartz is going to be signing there. So that's a nice sign. I think that's a good signing for them, but hopefully they can at least field a more competitive team because right now they don't really look like they're going to be good. Yeah, I would say no to Brandon Saad going to Seattle simply because it's been reported that Jaden Schwartz is signing there. Um, I think that that covers that need, Um, but who knows? Maybe it's possible that, uh, he could be a Kraken. Um, but beyond that, there's really not a whole lot. I don't know. There's really not um, as big of a market for Brandon Sod as I expected there to be. So, you know, I think that this is a very unique opportunity. I saw the Kings were in on him. I guess I understand that because they see a need. They see, I think, an opportunity to make the playoffs next year. That division sucks. I mean, it's Vegas yeah. and. Vegas and who else really? I mean, Edmonton will probably get it because McDavid is there. He can carry their corpses in with dry sidle. Outside of that, though, I mean, Arizona, I mean, Arizona's not going there. I mean, Seattle's probably not going to be good. Vancouver's probably not going to be good. I don't know about Calgary. Um, San Jose is not good. Anaheim's not good. Los Angeles, I mean, they're. They could they could make some pretty savvy additions. I don't. I saw Elliot also link the Islanders. I don't really see that happening because they have a lot of RFAs to pay. So um, that's going to be interesting. I was noticing earlier today, just looking at who's going to get overpaid tomorrow. Uh, speaking of a former Islander, Casey Zizekas, that's going to be like a six times four deal. One hundred percent. I can't wait for Toronto be, to be the team. <laughs> I can't wait. Brandon Tandem got six times 3.5, and, and Sezikis outscores him. I mean, come on here. Uh, that's not, that's prime for an overpayment. Absolutely. Did you see that the uh, Leafs are already crawling into the $5 DVD bin and uh, saying that they're going to sign Del Call and the host saying the two way deals? I did see Open. that. Yeah, I did. Oh, my God. Imagine they sign him, they sign. They bring they sign those two, bring out Chaniak back. It's just going to be like literally an all time NHL draft bus team. It's ridiculous. Plus, did you see? Did you see they're in on Martin Jones? Yeah, Martin Jones is washed at this point. I don't really, I don't really know what Kyle Dubas is doing up there. Again, for all Penguins fans, stay away. I, as much as how funny it would be to acquire Braden Holpe because it would piss off a lot of Capitals fans. And it would make the Yinzers who said, who did all the Holtby chants make look like idiots. Um, he's washed. Do not, do not want him. He, 
He's below 890 the last two years. Um, he, he has a lot of miles on those tires. I'd stay way clear of that. If we're going on yeah. the goalies in Toronto, I'm thinking of like just put potential fits possibly. A name that we've brought up a lot for the Penguins here, Dougie, is uh, Linus Allmark. You think he'd be a good fit up in Toronto? It can make sense. Um, it, a lot of it's going to boil down to the price, of course, because, you know, they're always looking for cap bargains. But um, I could see that, um, you know. But, like, if you're going to take a chance on someone like Linus Allmark, why wouldn't you just bring Frederick Anderson back, you know? They're pretty similar, and I don't know. But I think Allmark would be good there. It's just a matter of, you know, plus, like, regardless of who they bring in, their numbers are probably going to be better anyways because they're going to be splitting time with Jack Campbell. So it's not like they're going to be – the main guy and they're going to get ran like 60, 70, 65 to 70 games a year. So I think, I think that's, that's, could actually switch with all Mark. I think he could end up in Buffalo actually. I did see that they're trying to negotiate with him. And I think I thought I saw a report that he was asking for six times six. Don't really know where that came from, but um, he's not worth that. I think Philip Grubauer was also asking that from uh, Colorado. It's like, there, there's a lot of goalies. There's a few goalies that I would give that to. It's just, I, I don't know. You know, sure, he was the Vezin nominee, but that, that's the position that you don't want to give a lot of money out to unless it's to, again, a prime Lundquist, a prime Carey Price, you know, even a prime Flurry back in the day. Um, just there's, there, there's going to be some interesting overpayments tomorrow. Blake Coleman comes to mind. For as much as I would love the Penguins to sign him, not going to happen. That's going to be probably one of the biggest overpayments of the day, to be honest. That's going to be like a six time six deal. I think Blake Coleman will end up getting paid more than Zach Hyman does, which is crazy. Because Hyman's going to get seven years for about 5.5 to six per. Yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's a given that um, Coleman gets six, though. Yeah, some team is going to look at him and be like, well, he was the key to Tampa Bay Stanley Cups, even though he played on the third line with Yanni Gordon and um, Barkley Goudreau. But um, he's still a good player, but it's, that's going to be a monster overpayment. Yeah, it's going to be huge. You think what? Dallas would be the one to pay it potentially? I was gonna say either Dallas or Calgary, because I know he's. I think he's from like the Dallas area. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure he's from around that area. So you know, since we're talking about hometown kids, I mean that could be a potential fit for him, depending on how much they want to throw at him. Because obviously they've uh, lost Alexiak in uh, in the Seattle, so maybe that opened up a little bit uh, of cap space there for them. Yeah, he is from Texas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's from Plano, Texas. So I could see Dallas being all over that. Um, I think Dallas is all over Ryan Suter, too. I think they're a finalist for him, from what I read yeah. or listened to on 31 Thoughts. It makes a lot of sense because, again, Alexiak left. Um, it may have a hole to fill there. I also saw Florida was pretty big on him, which is – I guess they're in on everything now. They're trying to go even further next year, and why not? You, you got to sell Barkov long-term. I think he only has next year left on his deal. So they're trying to sell it on him before – he has a big decision to make when it comes to free agency. And, you know, another team that I just thought of that could be a potential, that could be a good place for Sear to play at, because they're missing a couple left-handed defensemen now, would be Washington. Yep. Got, they just traded away Brendan Dillon. You got to figure they're not bringing back Char. Char is because he's probably going to end up retiring now. So, I mean, there's a, there's a need on the left side there for, <clears throat> excuse me, the Washington back end, and that could be a potential place for him to end up as well. Good point yeah that actually makes a lot of sense it also helps their decor a lot because i don't really think it's that good right now anyway you have carlson or who are pretty decent um justin schultz eh, and then trevor van reeves who's just eh, too and then nick jensen that's like five defensemen right there who are you know i mean two of them are pretty good i guess but the next three are just kind of mad but yeah I, I agree scotty i think him and washington makes a lot of sense in a top four role yeah, it's just 
you know, his, his market's going to be interesting because there's been a lot of reports that it's going to take a four year contract to get him. And at this point in Ryan Suter's career, does anybody, should anyone feel comfortable giving him a four year deal? I don't think so. Not don't really, I don't think so. Yeah. I mean, he, he's older at this point, but he's still good. Um, it's just, He's, the wheels have fallen off a little bit, but he can still produce a decent amount. You probably are better off signing him to a short-term deal, though. Yeah. And, I mean, if you do do the four-year thing, all, you could always just dump him off to Edmonton or something after year three, you know. Somebody will be crazy enough to take a, give you a legitimate return out of that guy just because of the uh, career he's had. So I could see that being the case. Yeah. But – um. Before we wrap up here, um, what do you guys think of um, Mike Sullivan being named the head coach of Team USA? Only good option. I mean, he's a top five coach in hockey, arguably the greatest coach in franchise history. Right up, it's a one A one B with Badger Bob, in my opinion. If he wins mm-hmm. another cup, um, I know a lot of people will think it's a weird take, but if he wins another cup, he's the best coach in franchise history. It's not even close, to be yeah. honest. One hundred percent. But this has been the right choice. And, you know, I finally think they're, they're going to have a good team this time and they'll build it the right way with all speed and skill, a mobile defense. You know, they're not going to grow for this sandpaper garbage that you saw in 2016 with Brandon freaking Dubinsky making it and Eric Johnson making it for some reason. And I, I think Ryan Callahan was on the team too and a whole bunch of you other. Who else was on that team? Jack Johnson. Yeah, I, I was right. Jack frickin' Johnson made Jack that. Jack Johnson. Just hilarious. I mean, yeah. you're not, you're not going to see that this time. There's, you know, for as much as we dog on, they can put Seth Jones on there. They can put the Kachuk brothers on there. Austin Matthews, Patrick Kane, Jake Gensel, Joe Pavelski, even though he's a bit older. TJ Oshie, for as much as we like to rag on him, just because his only good moment is the Olympic thing from 2014. Um, he'll be on there. It's John Gibson and Nett. I think Connor is Connor Hellebuck gonna make it, right? Probably. Yeah, it'll be John Gibson, Connor Hellebuck, and your personal coin flip between Spencer Knight or Thatcher Demko. Yeah, I mean, you have the makings of a pretty freaking good roster. Um, probably won't be able to beat Canada, but with Sullivan at the helm, you never know. Yeah, and my thing is with the USA is if they do send the NHL players. This is the best center depth they've ever had, you know. Um, obviously, we don't know what's going to go on with Eichel if he gets his neck done, but it, fully healthy, your center depth down the middle is going to be Eichel, Matthews, Dylan Larkin, and I'd imagine JT Miller would be the fourth line center with Jack Hughes being the extra forward. I would think so. I mean – Again, man, like this is going to be like a really – there's so much young talent in the system now that can make the team, and it's going to be so so much fun to watch. I'm sure I've, I've missed so many good players that I didn't name, but, um, you know, Wierenski, I think, from Columbus could make it as well defensively. There's just – John, I'm sure. I think John. I think John Carlson is. He, I think he yeah. should be on there too. So I mean, again, like it's just they'll build it the right way. This was the right choice. Hopefully, Stan Bowman either resigns or knows what he's doing when he builds the team with him. I guess. Mm-hmm. You know, and I think that the defense is so loaded that Seth Jones isn't in the top six defense group. Yeah, because you got to think you're going to have Slavin, Adam Fox. Yeah, Quinn Hughes, John Carlson, and then your third pair would be Wierenski and Charlie McAvoy. Yeah, I mean, that's that's stacked. I mean, it, it, it can stack up to Canada pretty pretty good, um, I would say. I mean, they're not going to have, you know, obviously Eric Carlson. I don't even think they're not even going to have Victor Hedman. Isn't Victor Hedman going to be on Sweden? Yeah. Yeah, so that's they're not going to even have a couple of those guys, so. Yeah, I mean, you know, the only thing that, I mean, Canada is going to be interesting because, you know, you have Sid and then obviously McDavid and McKinnon are two of the best players in the world. 
We'll put Jim Wu on there. Tavares, Taves if he's healthy. Um, I'd go as far as saying that Anthony Sorelli is the fourth line center of Team Canada right now. What about then? What you got Bergeron? It's gonna yeah. happen here. Marshawn will make it. Um, oh, O'Reilly, oh, oh, right? O'Reilly will be. Yeah. There. That's just they're gonna be. Again, Canada is usually very unbeatable. Um, I'm trying to. Is, is Carey Price on? He'll he, he'll be he'll be there. I'm sure if he's still healthy. I mean, yeah. he um, they're they'll win it all probably. But still, anyway, going back to what we were talking about. Yeah, Sullivan, I think, is the best coach that can potentially lead the U.S. to one of the biggest upsets we've ever seen, just because Canada's going to be so loaded. Does Canada have their coach picked yet, or are they still up in the air right now? Up in the air. Yeah. I think it's still up in the air. I don't. I can't even think of like who could be the coach. I know, like, it was Babcock for the longest time, and clearly that's not going to happen. So it would be. Uh, wouldn't it be? Um, I. I think I. Is is Barry Trotz? Is he from? I'm trying to. Rem- I'm trying to remember where he's from, but I think he's Canadian, if I recall correctly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's from yeah. Where- that makes a lot of sense right there. Then him. Um, Oh no, no, not him. I think John Cooper might be on Mike Sullivan's staff. Um, because he's 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 a US born coach, so they can team up and yeah, I think it'll be probably Trots if I had to guess. I don't really know who else they'll pick. Um I don't know off the top of my head. I I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting, but like obviously, yeah, we talked about John Cooper probably being on Mike Sullivan's staff. Julian Breezeball is probably gonna be the GM for Team Canada. Yeah, and good point. That's gonna be that's gonna be something. Yep. Um, Not fun. Yeah, but uh, is there anything else small that you guys want to add? I have one kind of small thing. Uh, Ov signed his extension today at uh, five years at nine and a half mil. So now he's so now he's got a five year window to score two hundred and sixty five goals in order to break uh, Gretzky's record. Do we think he can do it? Wouldn't bet yes. against him. Would not bet against that dude. I think he can. Will he do it? I don't know. Can he do it? Yes. You um, need to average like fifty three goals a year. I saw. 33 yeah i think he can if, if he stays healthy that dude's a cyborg i think he could potentially do it i was surprised at five years because he's going to be 40 when that retires but i also realized when i look at their cap friendly guys um him and backstrom expire the same year they'll retire and go off into the sunset together so i think that's probably why ovechkin did that yeah and i think with ob it's like you know in an 80 in a 482 game year he's going to have another like 55, 60 goal season in him. And it's going to cut like everything that he needs to do in like half at that point, you know, because like he's going to have a 60 goal year. I'm going to say probably like two or three years into that contract on top of what he already did the first couple years of the contract. He's going to be like within reach in a big way, you know? And then who knows, you might ride off into the KHL and break their, their goal record. It's not that big. He can just go play with Dynamo and just play yeah. with them for a year or something with Datsuk if he's still playing. Um, that'll that, that'll be it for his NHL career after that contract. Imagine Backstrom goes to Dynamo too. That'd be kind of funny. I don't foresee he played Because he played there in the lockout. Like, yeah. they'll, they'll both retire after that. They'll Like I said, they'll ride off into the sunset together. Yeah. Probably, David probably Pagnota was... just tweeted this. Um, they the Dallas Stars are pushing hard to sign Ryan Suter to a multi-year deal. Yeah, makes all the sense in the world. Friedman just touched on apparently uh, seven times seven is on the table for Landis Cog in Colorado. He's weighing it, um, and there's also the possibility of an eight-year eight times seven. So we'll see what happens with that. Yeah, I think seven million would be respectable for um, Landis Cog. You know. I understand the whole, like, you got to pay him a little more than what he might be worth because he's been there when they were terrible. Like, yeah. he was a big part of the team that got them made, you know? And, I mean, 
the guys that he had to play with, like the centers that he went through before he finally hit gold with Landeskog was, or with uh, McKinnon was huge. Like, you know, he was there with Paul Stasny, um, Matt Duchesne, whenever he was disengaged and didn't want to be there. Ryan O'Reilly, whenever he was the subject to trade rumors, literally every single summer until he got moved to Buffalo. You know, like the guy has been through it all. He deserves to stay there and win there and be paid rightfully so. Yeah. All right, guys. Anything else? All good over here. Good over here, too. All right, guys. Sounds good. Um, Thank you, Hunter, for coming on. You got anything big coming up that you want to plug or no? Uh, I'm working on a couple of things, you know, I'm not going to say anything just yet. You know, I'll have another, I'll have an episode up probably later today on all the Mark andre Fleury stuff. And hopefully we'll get some other action today before the big day tomorrow. All right, guys. Um, you can find Twitter or you can find Hunter on Twitter at Hunter Hodes, and you can follow locked on penguins, Twitter at L O underscore penguins. Um, this was our latest little, um, episode of for checking tv be sure to subscribe to us on youtube follow us on follow us on twitter on at for at for checking tv and um we will talk to you guys again in a couple hours where we will be joined by jesse marshall thank you guys and we'll see you in a bit